Okay, right, we're going to move straight on. And we're going to be talking about the development of next generation of elite African athletes through growing youth football academies. Now, Africa has a rich history of developing some of the world's most gifted footballers. And if we, we mentioned the World Cup in Qatar, well, that tournament has expanded from 16 to 24 to 32 teams. And that expansion has matched... I suppose, the, the growth of the, the game that we've seen and also the talents that we've seen come through it. So, for example, in the 1980s, 1990s, we had, of course, Roger Miller and George Weir. And then after that, the talents of Kanu, Drogba, Essien, Eto in the 2000s, Yaya Toure after that. And then in this current decade, of course, and we've heard them mentioned already on stage today, Sadio Mane, Mo Salah, Riyad Mahrez. OK, so how do we get here? Well, financial help from elite European clubs and also private African investors helped launch locally-based youth academy systems. And what they did is they identified, they recruited and developed young talent, often supported by corporate foundations and NGOs. So we know that African talent has been there. It's been there for a while. It abounds, but, and this is the key thing, we can't get complacent about it. As much as there are some brilliant elite players at the very top of their game, even right now, Africa has to find ways to keep up that performance. We know that the passion for football is here. We also know that the population on this continent skews younger. So those are advantages. But how do we maximize that and ensure a sustainable, and that's the key word here, a sustainable pathway up all the levels of the game to ensure that those talented young players get the chance to fulfill their undoubted huge potential. This is a fascinating subject. It's one that requires a, a lot more discussion and we'll do so with the following guests on stage. So please welcome the president and founder of Jomo Cosmos Football Club, Dr. Ephraim Jomo Sono, and the head of international operations at TSG Hoffenheim, Tony Mamodali, and your moderator, co-founder and managing director at Golden City Football Club, Jabo Mtwa. Please welcome them on stage. Gents, great to see you. Thank you very much indeed. As I mentioned, um, another Im very important discussion. We know that a youth football development is one that's important to develop. It's one that's important to find the right way of creating that sustainable pathway. Jabu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, David. Um, huge opportunity now to speak about what forms the bedrock of African football ecosystem, which is our youth academies across the continent. Clearly, as you've seen over the years, Africa has produced the most elite footballers that have staged the most amazing matches and goals that we've seen. Didier Drogba, Samuel Eto'o, these are players that are the shining lights of Africa. And for them to even reach that stage, it's important to have a basis of really strong, strengthened youth football academies. At the moment, there are some legal issues in terms of training compensation and really the system that underpins the entire ecosystem when it comes to our academy. So this conversation essentially is going to evaluate where we are at the moment with Dr. Ephraim Jomosono, who is probably, in my opinion, the highest and most acclaimed talent identifier on the continent, as well as CSG Ein Einhoven, I'm saying Einhoven. Hoffenheim. Hoffenheim. <laughs> <laughs> um, head of operations, Tony Modali. Thank you so much for doing this, guys. Just firstly, Tony, in terms of our systems, when it comes to our academies and looking at Africa for now in particular, I know you have something to say about this, Dr. Chomo. What are the issues in terms of the system at the moment and how can you move to advance that to ensure that players have maximized player development and that the opportunities are sky high? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you um, very much for the invitation. Very grateful to be here this morning. Um, I think the most important um, thing is that we start um, actually taking a step back and that we realize that we cannot solve the issues that we're facing today with the very systems that actually created them. So what we did in Hoffenheim is that we actually said we need to go back to the basics, to the very fundamentals, and we need to put the human beings front and center of everything that we're trying to do because we need to have coherent people in our system, both on the operational side as well as on the field, um, in order to to function well. And the, the, the thing is that um, 
when we speak about a coherent person or a compassionate person, so to say, it's a person that is able to listen. It's a person that is able to show respect for other people. It's a person that is able to show and develop an attitude of, of gratitude. Um, and most importantly, only a, a person that is compassionate is able to um, be in a compassionate relationship. And the thing in, in, in a sports organization, but that's also true for any other organization, in order to be successful, in order to be um, successful and, and successfully be in a competition with other people from the outside world, I think it's important that you, first of all, learn to collaborate internally. And so for us, it's really important that we have a um, system that is coherent um, from the inside, because if we go to the outside world and we seek our place within society in general, um, then we actually need to be at the point where we have to have a coherent organization um, in order to be relevant and actually in order to be taking a place that is relevant within society in general. And so um, to basically take another step back, um, the way that we try to approach talent development and everything in our organization um, is, is really um, starting with the human being at the core of everything that we do. And so when we speak about talent, yes, we speak about the first team players, um, while we also speak about the academy players, um, but it's also very important that we speak about the coaches. And most importantly, and this is maybe coming as a little bit of a surprise, but um, the most important thing is that we have staff in place that is coherent because the staff picks the coaches. The coaches develop our academy players and the academy players hopefully one day turn into first team players. And to show to you that it's, it's not just charity what I'm talking about and this is something that we're just picking out of the blue, it's, it's, it's a clear strategy that translates into business value later on. So just to show you a little bit um, of what it means um, in, on our end is on the, on the professional side, we were able to generate um, transfer values in excess of 300 million in the last 10 years. Um, we've developed over 100 players um, into first team players or Bundesliga and second Bundesliga players. Um, and we have a permeability of 23%. Now, 23% um, sounds like a lot. Um, especially in contrast um, or in comparison to the, the average of the German league at the moment is 1% to 3%. But the mindset that we have in Hoffenheim is really the understanding that 23% means that three out of four players are not going to make a living as a professional football player. So we need to keep thinking about them every single time we take a decision because at the end of the day, these are all human beings. Um, and then on the, on the coaching side, and don't want to go too much into detail, but um, we've developed over 20 coaches that started their coaching career at our academy um, that have been on the, on the world stage. So we have got Julian Nagelsmann, just to give you one example, that started his career with 26 years old. Um, and at one point last year, um, we had five coaches from our academy that were at the same time coaching in the Bundesliga. Um, and then on the staff side, and this just not to pick up too much on it, but we've developed over 25 people that are currently in executive roles in world football. And just to, to show you that from a, from a statistical perspective really quickly, just so you can take something away with you. Um, I think um, the first two I don't need to introduce, um, Bobby Firmino that came to us, um, and I just um, to tell you this, um, in, in private, um, the former manager that was there back then, um, Ernst Tanner, he said, when Firmino came to us, he was in a, in a, on a fitness level that was weaker than his grandma. <laughs> and so um, the clear strategy, a data-based um, individual approach to developing talent is, is at the core of what we do, but it always needs to fit in and tie in with the human being front and center. Um, then on the academy side, we've got Niklas Süle who started his um, career um, with us who's going to the World Cup with the national team. Um, Julian Nagelsmann, as I mentioned before, and then on the, on the, on the staff side, and this is maybe the slide that I want to leave you with, um, because it's, it's basically the starting point of every conversation that we have, is that we want to develop human beings on all, on all levels of the organization. And so the, the guy that you're seeing here, Christopher Vivell, is about to take the next um, big job in world football, um, and I don't, don't want to spill the beans and I don't want to jinx it either, but he's most likely going to Chelsea as a new technical director. Um, 
And so just to show you a little bit of the strategy that, and, and the results that it can lead to if you have a clear system in place that puts the human being at the front yeah. and center and the core of every um, thing that you try to do as an organization. What I'm getting there is that there's four fundamental components when it comes to TSG, Hoffenheim's academy structure or the approach that they bring to it is first team, academy, coaches and staff. For you at Jomo Cosmos, uh, Jomo, how do those interactions play with each other in terms of those components? You need really good coaches to be coaching those young players in order for them to maximize their player development and their potential. So how important is it that you also have really good coaching as much as you have a good player development structure underpinning it? Yeah, I think uh, I, uh, I would say good afternoon <laughs> before I start. I think I would agree with Tony on most of the points. You know, when it comes to development, it's, a, it's all about a human being and adding value to the lives of these, of these young kids. Right. You know, it's very, very important. And uh, at Cosmos, we've been doing it for, for years. If we can put the slides here, it can take us another three days. Yeah, it'll take too long. You know, all the players <laughs> uh, we, we, have, uh, we have produced. Yeah. And uh, even now, we, we're, we're now we're starting to produce coaches. You have Pizzo Simon, you have Herman Kalela, Sapula, they're all now, all Cosmos the kids Wadi. from Cosmos are all moving into coaches now. So we, 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 we're proud because we have added a little value. We know and we always tell them when we, when we take them at Cosmos that make sure that you mix the two, school and football, because the life Span of a soccer player is very, very short. You can go now on a 50-50 tackle and then, or you, you meet Rabutla by mistake and then you're out. You know, no, it's by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> that I have to emphasize so that tomorrow it must not come in the, in the press that I said Rabutla must hammer them. By mistake and then the poor kid is out of football. So it's important. You know, if you, we, we, we had a, a player who came to, to Cosmos, uh, Dr. Victor Matisela. He came for trials. And uh, he was speaking English, very high English. <laughs> hey. So we gave him a chance to play. He was bad. Eh? It was, it was very bad, very bad. And I asked him, I said, hey, ukulele look I was not possible. He says, no, I've been at school in Petersburg. And I called him aside because sometimes if you are involved with these kids, you have to be frank because you are a father to them. You have to be honest. If, if you can see the kid is not going to make it, tell him, don't waste his time and, you know, so I called Victor to the office. I gave him tea. And I, I said to Victor, eh, what I'm going to tell you is not nice, but I have to tell you. I woke up, but the PSL by then had a, had a, a buzzer. I said, because of your qualifications and the, you, you, you want to go to the university, let me apply on your behalf, as if we, we are Zal. So I applied on behalf of Victor Matisel, as a player, because that, that, that fund was for players. So I registered him. And he, he, I said to him, go to school, leave football. He went to university. Today, Dr. Matisel, He's one of the big doctors in the wow. country. Wow. You know? Wow. So we, we, we're proud of that. Yeah. And if you look at the bridge to be a professional soccer player, it's too narrow. Not all of them can cross. Even the best soccer players will fall on the wayside yeah. because the bridge is too narrow. 
And those who will go through in football are those with a big heart. They go through. It's not only talent or skill which you look at on a player. There's more to that. You know, sometimes you, you find a player, Obuya is from the rural areas. He, he, he comes to Joburg. Joburg is too big. We are Kalan Obuya believe to the moon to his trouble. I'm talking to you. So it's also the culture from where it comes from. I can give one example. The, the, there was one player called Helman Mkale. Helman, if he said, Saubona, is for the whole day. He's an introvert. He was not talking to anybody. The only sentence you got from him was Sabon. So you have to try and mold him to be part and pass. Not only skill football. Mm. There's a lot into grooming a young boy. Mm. You know, you have to check where he comes from, the culture and so forth. And then what I used to do, I used to ask Helmet to be the one to start singing because he was quiet. You know, you know the players, they like to sing. And I would ask Helmut to, to start singing. Yeah. And you could see that by me saying that to him, I have killed him. But you got used to it. Today he's a coach. So development, there's a lot into development. Tony can tell you. You get players from different areas, from all over, I, I get them from all over, you know, from, so there's a lot the clubs are putting into, into developing a player. It's not only about, like I said, 4-4-2, four, four, no, it, it, it's, it's a human, yeah. it's a human thing yeah. all around. Yeah. So, and one thing about us that you have to be very patient with this, kids because of the surrounding, where they come from, and so forth. But just to divert a bit, you, you raised an issue which is very close to my heart, the issue of a conversation. We're talking about academies in Africa. As academies, we're doing so much. But the issue we also discussed with Tony on the other side. The issue is that Africa, some of the African countries have got no clear idea how to structure a contract of an amateur player. Because most of the African players, you, you, you can work, develop a player, spend time, because spending time with that player is spending money. Yeah. Your time is money. So we spend so much time, energy, everything. And when the player becomes a, a superstar, there comes a big team, takes the boy for free. The boy is gone. What about the poor guy who was developing this player? What about the poor guy who discovered this player? He gets nothing. So also the contracts have to be tied up in such a way that the big teams can't come and take their players for, for free in Africa. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you look at now, you look at Belgium, 75% of the players playing in Belgium, they're black. You go to France, maybe 65 is black players coming from Africa. If proper contracts were done and proper compensation was paid to these teams, then Africa will compete. We can compete because at least now the academies are getting money and by getting this money, they can invest back into their academies. You can't invest anything because you're busy taking money from your own pocket. Yeah. So those are some of the things which we must tie tie down. Yeah. 
so that we can be protected and we can also grow. And growing, it means we, for instance, Cosmos, has to, can make a deal with Tony and say, let's exchange. You know, your coach is coming this side and then our coach is going that side. You know, the cultural exchange is, is also key. Yeah. And uh, I, for one, strongly believe maybe not this World Cup, maybe the next World Cup. Africa has to win the, 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 the next World Cup. If we tie up all these smaller things, smaller and other things, and then put it into place, and then we tie up with teams from, from overseas, yeah. because we are lacking behind. We are definitely lacking behind. We, we, we need from grassroots to have coaches who are qualified. At the moment, we don't have coaches who are qualified uh, uh, at SAFA level, at, uh, at yeah. schools level. Yeah. We, we don't have. Yeah. And the people are wondering as to South Africa started there, and all of a sudden, my country has gone down. But the, 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 the answer is simple. From, from 96, we kept all the way down. But it's simple. If you look at the history of our country, Bafana Bafana, when it comes to development, in 1996, we won the Africa Cup of Nations. I was part of the, of the team. We had 99% of the players playing overseas and playing regular, not sitting on the bench or sitting on the grandstand, playing regular. I won't mention the names. In the 1998, we had 80% 80 80 of the players playing overseas. In 2002, in the World Cup, we won the Four Nations Cup. We beat uh, Switzerland in the final before we moved to, to the World Cup. We had 85% of the players playing in Europe. And two of the midfielders were selected after the World Cup for the first 11 for the World Cup. And strange enough, one of the players who was selected Mark Batsibaya is from this province in Natal. He meant uh, the Boko Mkwena was selected for the world invitation. But ever since then, there's few players going overseas. There's a lot of players coming back. Whether we like it or not, the standard of, of coaching here and the standard of coaching in Europe is too, completely different. Yeah. So, I mean, something that I'm getting from there is just the strategic value of technical partnerships between European football clubs or international football clubs and African football clubs. Although you find cases where you have extremely good academies across the continent, Jomo Cosmos being one in South Africa, which is a leading light, Right to Dream Academy in Ghana and Egypt, West African Football Academy, which was opened by Fire North. You see the value of the strategic partnerships that can link up in order to maximize the chances that players can get. So there is a common value approach at Hoffenheim where you are really pushing it through. Could you just explain what that entails and how it really tries to tackle the problems that we're getting from the grassroots in terms of our youth academies for them to get clear pathways all the way to the top? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, Dr. Yomo just touched base on a lot of issues that um, are very close to my heart and that are very important um, moving forward. And I think um, one of the most important things is that in order to move forward as a football world, as a football family, as a whole, I think we, we need radical collaboration. We need collaboration between the different clubs, between the different organizations, between the different federa federations. Um, and so one of the things that we, we did is um, we launched the so-called Common Value Club Alliance, um, which we started um, basically in 2020 with uh, Major League Soccer's FC Cincinnati, um, which is one of the newest additions to the league. Very innovative club, very data-driven club um, with a very rich 
um, um, soccer community very, um, and, and by rich I mean very, very interested and very engaged in, 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 in football um, in the community. Um, and actually in 2021 we added one of the biggest clubs in Africa, um, the Accra Hearts of Oak, um, to that partnership. Um, and we called it the, the Common Value Club Alliance. And Common Value basically stands for everybody grows together by sharing knowledge because when we share knowledge, that knowledge is actually multiplied. And it's not that we give something away because the most important thing is that we have not invented football. We found a way for us and we found a way that works for us. But in order to move on and in order to really to grow as an organization, we need other organizations and we need to learn. And we are here um, today because we want to learn. We are not here because we want to show you how great of an organization we are. We are here because we want to learn from other organizations here in Africa. And uh, I think that's the mindset that really needs to be implemented um, on, on a much bigger stage. And so we said, um, basically the foundation of this partnership is um, we, we dub it three continents, three clubs, one mission. And the mission is not to develop one player and send one player to the next organization, but rather to really have a holistic development platform um, that promotes excellence on and off the field while driving value for the people, planet, and society. Because we don't want to take, we want to give something, and we want to create value by partnering with other organizations. Um, and so basically the partnership pillars um, are distributed equally among four um, different pillars, which is starting with talent, because at the end of the day, we are football clubs, we need to develop talent. Um, and we need to, in order to be authentic and in, in order to really make an impact, we need to have conversations about um, talent development, coaches, players, staff. So that's all based around uh, knowledge exchange. So that's the second pillar where we said we need to have radical collaboration um, across these three organizations because that's going to advance each and every organization itself. And then the third uh, pillar is which is basically based on the first and the second, is that um, we want to do something for our communities. Because once we collaborate across three continents, yeah. think of, about how many people you can reach. Um, and just to give you one example, to show you how we try to look outside of the scope of football, um, just one, one example which I, I, I found um, yeah, extremely, extremely devastating, but where we have a huge opportunity is uh, in Accra, you have one of the biggest e-waste um, dumps in the world, which is called Agbog Bloshi. Agbog Bloshi used to be a community before the actual um, industrial countries came in and just dumped the e-waste illegally. And so what's, what happened is that you have one of the highest cancer rates in the world in this community, in the middle of Accra. And our main sponsor is PreZero, which is a waste recycling company. And so what we try to do is we, we want to raise awareness for these issues. And if Accra Hearts of Oak would do it by, the, by, the, by themselves, yeah, the impact would be little. Sure. If Cincinnati and Hearts of Oak do it on two continents, impact is much bigger. Yeah. But now think about how we can address these topics if we communicate across three continents and we address these issues. Maybe we cannot change that immediately, but we can definitely put a lot of eyes on these issues. Yeah. And so um, the fourth pillar that basically results out of the first three pillars is that we can create sustainable business models together. And so this is the mindset that we try to do, uh, that we try to implement, because we believe that it creates opportunities, business opportunities, opportunities and pathways for players, um, which at the end of the day also result in new revenue streams. because. Again, this is not a, not a charity that we're trying to build. This is a, a sustainable business model mm. and a strategy that we developed in Half Nine. Yeah. Abjobo, in your previous answer, you spoke on two you know, really important issues for me. One is education and how you integrate that within an academy offering, especially mm. when you look at our specific circumstances in Africa and the lack of access to really quality education. Academies can be definitely a force in driving, you know, more children being able to access education opportunities. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you spoke about the training compensation 
which is also some really important issues that are still happening in Africa where you get clubs not getting or having their claims to money that are owed to them due to the development of players in the past. So the first issue in terms of education, and maybe Tony, you can also um, jump in on this one, is how important is it to add education and being able to encourage players to also focus on the education as much as possible because there is an oversaturation, especially in South African football in particular, there's an oversaturation of players in the market and I'm sure you know this very well. So there's only a 10% that is really going to make it, if not five to 1%. So how do you also make sure that education is an important component so that the 90% of players who don't make it also still have those skills and the capabilities to really do whatever they want in their lives? Actually, when it comes to education, if we get a kid from, from outside or you sign at, uh, at Jomo Cosmo, we force you to go to school. Okay. You have to go to school. Because I coach you to go to school. And I understand that. I'm so cool. Sure. Do you understand? Yeah. He has to be educated. Because I think I spoke to a friend of mine in Europe where he said in France, they are not now. If a player is coming from Africa, he's not educated, he hasn't got a metric, they don't take you. you. You have to have, because if you're going to talk to somebody who's not educated, hey, it's trouble. It's like talking to a stone. So if he's educated, he will understand if you say, let's do it this way, let's do it this way. So at Cosmos, we put them to school, we transport them every morning to, to the school and drop them back because some, others will say they are going to school, they are not going to school. So the transport is there to take them to school and then bring them back. So yeah. we, for, we force, you have to go to school. Yeah. And Right to Dream Academy call their players, not athletes, not just youth players, but they call them student athletes. And I think that's a very perfect term to label on a player because it's still children at the end of the day. These are minors that you're mm. dealing with. And so calling them a student first before an athlete just goes to show the value of being a student and of having education. At Hoffenheim, what is the importance of that education component within your academy and how much do you push that through? Yeah, um, you, you basically just mentioned one of the, probably I would say North Stars in terms of academies not only in Africa, but in, in, in the world in general. And Right to Dream is, is one of the academies that really serves as a role model of what it means to, to have a human-centric approach to developing talent. Um, I've actually had the chance to, to visit them uh, two, two months ago when we were in Accra. Um, and it was fascinating to me to see how open they were. So one of the first things that when we requested um, the meeting, we were like, okay, maybe we go there and maybe they're going to show us all the shiny stuff that, they want, that we want to see. But we got there and they basically showed us everything. And the first thing that, that really comes to mind is that um, the academy is based in the middle of nowhere. It's three hours outside of Accra. There's nothing to do around it. So as a young talent, you're able to focus ex exactly on the things that you're being taught. Um, the second thing is that um, their curriculum is really built around football but it is leading somewhere, even if you're not making it as a professional player. So they are basically opening, opening up the pathway to the college landscape in the United States. Um, and I've been, two weeks ago, I was uh, visiting some of our guys um, from Hoffenheim that are currently in the college landscape in the US, and we visited five programs, and all of these programs um, that are considered some of the best programs in college in the US um, had players from Right to Dream. And each and every one of them, if you ask them how he felt and what's his experience of Right to Dream, they all say, it changed my life. And this should be the way that we should be held accountable yeah. for how we treat players, right? If one player that doesn't make it says, the academy changed my life, then they surely did something right. And so to go back to the visit, we stayed there for two and a half hours. And, and what we realized is that they, they, they try to implement the academy in, in the most natural way. So there is no shiny training center. The cafeteria is not amazing. It's, they have a school inside there, which is not amazing either. But it just blends into the natural environment perfectly. Um, and so they, they keep that natural desire to make it to the next step yeah. pretty, pretty natural. Yeah. Um, 
And so when we left, one of the guys that were, was uh, with us, he said, oh, wow, actually, it's, it's, it's super easy to replicate their model. And I said, no, you didn't pay attention. It's super hard to replicate that model because what they have is that mindset that is unique and that is so, so seldom. And this is, this is something that is really important to understand, that the mindset that they are implementing in each and every player of, that they have um, is, is crucial. And that is something that, again, we, we are not here to say how great of an organization we are. We are here to learn. And so when we came back from there, we said, hey, Right to Dream doesn't release any player from their academy. If you go to the academy at 12, you stay there until you're 19 and you graduated from high school, and you're either going to be a professional player or you're going to go to college, where you're going to get a degree. So it's, it's stuff like that. It's important to us to understand, OK, what can we learn from other organizations and what can we implement? And so to answer your question, this is one of the things that we said, is we need to answer the question from the inside what we're doing with players that don't make it to the next stage. And so the college system for us is very important because it's a natural fit where they can actually go and continue playing on a very high level. They, can, um, they still have the chance to be a professional player after their college career. But in the worst case, um, they have a degree and they're set for life. And so maybe to, to, to finish my, my um, 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 exploration of Right to Dream Academy, they have this sentence, which I will never forget because it's, it's, it's a beautiful one. It says, if everything fails, then this is who we are. And I just love this sentence because it says that your mission as an organization is so strong that uh, it doesn't, you, you don't calculate success or you don't measure success only by the output of professional players mm. but actually by the values and characteristics that you implement in your players yeah i couldn't agree more and that just goes to show the importance of education and i suppose in my own life and in my own journey in the sports business i've seen the value of academies not only in making you a good football player but a good person with all the values that you need to succeed Myself and my co-founder at Golden City Football Club, Hassan Paruk, we went to Jabez Football Club, which is a, an academy based in Johannesburg. And while we did not make it in terms of going professional, we are now running a club, and we are probably the, yeah, the youngest club owners in Africa. And we're looking to use those skills that we got from the academy in now operating a football club. So it's about showing you know, your players or your student athletes, as Right to Gym puts it, that there are more opportunities apart from playing. There's more ways you can use the skills that you learn from an academy and apply it directly to a real-life context. So I think that's an essential thing, and I think academies across Africa need to make education at the heart of their philosophy. Another thing that is probably, you know, we can't go without speaking about this because it's at the heart of the issue of academies in Africa is the academy infrastructure, right? When we did scouting a couple of months ago, um, when we're still opening our football club and we'd go to places like Soweto, which is a township in Johannesburg, and you see the, the state of the you know, facilities and the pitches that are in there, they could be much better. You know, you find kids, and I'm sure you know this, Bob Jomo, where you go and scout for a player and they're probably playing on the streets or they're probably playing on the dead grounds, but they are such good players. Mm. So it's also about, I feel, and please just give me your opinion on this, on investing in the academy infrastructure, making it world-class facilities, so that in the long term as well, we don't always have to send our youth academy players, although there's a huge emphasis and a strategic value to having partnerships with clubs like you know, Hoffenheim, for example, in sending players or doing exchanges. But in the long term, certainly for African football, we need to have that academy infrastructure within our own continent so that we don't have to take our players overseas all the time. So that is something maybe you can speak about there in terms of the academy infrastructure, from the grassroots all the way up, how important is it that we have world-class facilities in order to retain our players in Africa in the long term in our academies? Yeah, you know, Shabu, you raise a very interesting point, but we cannot do those structures if we don't correct or fix the issue of compensation. Mm. You must understand, Guti, most of the club owners in the township, uh, we, we, we used to call them Abopreza. Abopreza. Yeah, Abopreza. Right. Uh, they are using their own money to run these clubs. Sure. So we have to go back 
and revisit the issue of compensation because there's too many players who are playing professional football now in, in South Africa, outside South Africa, who just go for free and there's no compensations for the development. So you can't develop, you can't do these structures if you don't have money. The, the, the other issue which can solve on that is to have a partnership with Hoffenheim. And then it's them maybe, Hoffenheim can say, okay, let us help you to build this ground right. in Soweto and the kids can train there. Right. So it's very, very vital to educate the club chairmen about the compensation. Yeah. I couldn't agree more with that. Just to wrap up, I see we've got two minutes left here. For you, Bob Joma, and then we're going to go to Tony. What are maybe three things you think in Africa we really need to work on in order to have a strengthened system of youth academies that essentially sustain the entire ecosystem? What are three issues maybe that we can focus on in order to make our academies as good as the ones in Europe or in the Americas? One, I'm going back, is compensation. Okay. <laughs> Compensation. You know, it's compensation too. Yeah. Is to get the coaches, but they must get licenses. Right. And then also exchange with Hoffenheim. Right. They must go there and and learn from from overseas and come back and uh, and coach the kids there. Tony, what are some? maybe two, three issues that you feel are important, and also from an international perspective, because you're representing a club from Germany. Also, when you look at the African Youth Academy ecosystem, what are things that you feel, if we could do this, then we could be much better? Um, I would say number one is getting the basics right. Um, and this is, this is so important that we experience that in our work um, with our partners every day. It's getting the basics right and doing the little things every single day that lead to great breakthroughs in the long run. Two, collaboration. Three, collaboration. <laughs> I like how it comes here twice. Yeah. This is uh, a really informative, I hope so, for everyone that has been listening, an informative session on a really important issue for the future of African football and dare I say the Africa Super League because the strength of our youth academies are definitely going to be measured against the success of the Africa Super League in the years to come and I hope you have a better sense of the issues that we're facing, the opportunities that we have as well, and also what the future is for African football youth academies across the continent. Thank you so much, Tony, Dr. Sono. Thank you so much for Thank being you. here. Thank you. That's it's now. It's now. Yeah. All right. I thought that was one of the best sessions we've had already. I really, really enjoyed that. What do we think, guys? I think, you know, we, we had three compelling speakers. Um, let's see to Tony from the, the German Football Club perspective with all of the knowledge and experience that he's got. And I love this idea that it's not just about the data because we've heard about data. We know how important it is, but it's about the person. We've got to speak about the cultures. Is the clear strategy of developing talent through data is the core of what we do, but it has to be focused on the human side. And I think that, that Jomo also really reinforced that. And yeah, I love, I love, I mean, Jomo's got some stories, isn't he? He's got some fantastic stories. He's such a, a wonderful uh, storyteller. Um, but, but again, really telling the truth of the matter here. Um, you know, Africa has some ground to make up, but that much is, is clear. Um, it's about being human beings and adding value to the lives of these young kids, you know, about how academies work and how they have to learn how to structure, quite simply, the contract of a, of a young football player in Africa. Because otherwise, those talents get pinched for next to nothing and those academies aren't growing. You can't get that foothold. And again, it refers back to what we heard a bit earlier on with the likes of Portugal, for example, or Brazil, where their talent comes through but of course they do continue to grow as as producers of incredible incredible football talent and include not just players but coaches and that cultural exchange let's spend time with each other let's learn from each other and I thought that you know Tony what he was t talking about with the the common value club alliance what a brilliant idea MLS Hoffenheim and Accra Hearts of Oak 
with those four pillars, talent, knowledge exchange, doing something for communities, which I love, by the way, uh, the e-waste the e dumped in, in a crowd, just trying to really minimize that problem as much as you can through the power of football and then creating sustainable business models together. A lot has come up from that last session. I think it was absolutely brilliant.